Hi, everybody. Welcome back. I'm Lisa Jarrett, and I'm one of the co-founders and co-directors of KS MOCA, which is the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. School Museum of Contemporary Art. And we are an art museum inside a public school in Northeast Portland, Oregon. The project is a collaboration between Portland State University School of Art and Design and Dr. MLK Jr. School. Um, I'm joined today by my co-founder and co-director, Harold Fletcher, who is also the founder of the PSU Art and Social Practice MFA program. And one of our primary collaborators, Amanda Lee Evans, who's been working with us for a number of years now. Um, we are delighted to welcome so Hela Azadi back for her second talk as part of our 2021 remote artist residency and lecture series. And I am so excited to have Mo here with us who will be interest, introducing Sohela for you in just a moment. Um, I wanna give a warm welcome to all of the Dr. MLK Junior School students who are watching this presentation via the KS Mocha YouTube live channel. And I want to make sure to thank deeply the collaborators at the school that work with us regularly to make sure that we can have these wonderful programs um, for and with our student participants. So big shout out to Jill Sage, the school principal, Nancy Rios, Michelle P and uh, Paige Thomas for everything that they do to, to bring this to, together with us. Um, and so Mo, uh, welcome. Would you care to tell us a little bit about Sohela? I would love to. Great. Um, hi, I'm Mo. I go to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. School. Today I'm introducing the artist Sohela Azadi. Sohela Azadi is a visual artist, writer, educator and mother based in Portland, Oregon and Iran. Born in the capital of Islamic City, Esfahan, she has learned storytelling skills through Persian miniature drawings and Islamic architecture since she was nine. As Azadi's arts come from her experience of being a woman of color living under theocracy and democracy. Azadi uses different media in her artwork to talk about gender, sex, or race, culture, and religion. She is in interested in how and where they overlap, she is really interested in telling a story, telling stories of women and men as minorities and also really likes to work with fabric. Welcome, Sohela. Thank you for being here today. Wow, amazing, Mo. Thank you so much for this amazing introduction. You did such a great job. Um, and thanks to everyone who made this possible and thanks for the opportunity. Um, so um, I'd like to share my uh, presentation with you guys. Um, okay. Here we go. So as Mo mentioned, my name is Suheila Azadi um, and my pronouns are she, he, hers. And um, today my plan is to talk about interactive art. Um, so learn about what it is and, um, and hopefully learn about uh, after the talk is over, you would know how to approach interactive arts when you come across it. Um, so when you go to big museums, what is the first thing that you are told? And what is the first thing that your parents tell you? Um, and I'm not talking about, um, you know, children's museum or, um, um, you know, museums that targeted for, uh, for um, students. I'm talking about those museums that have um, paintings on walls or big sculptures. Um, I can tell you what that is. The first thing is 
do not touch the art, right? But today we want to talk about um, art that you can actually touch, you can actually feel. And um, that is called interactive art. One category of it that I want to focus on today is interactive art. And interactive art is a form of art that you can actually go to it, approach it, right? Touch it, feel it, sometimes sit on it, sometimes walk through it, um, take away from it. There are art pieces that we will be talking about today that you can actually take a small part of it home. Uh, or you can actually eat it. So with your body, you can interact with it. So that is called interactive art. To better understand this, I have this um, short video that I like to show you guys. There are big words in it. So don't be afraid if you don't understand them because I will be talking about all of them. And um, let's do this, okay. Hi, my name's Jackie. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and share this video. Here we go. It's just four minutes. Fine. And in this series, we're going to be taking a close look at what's called performance art, exploring five different ways in which we might encounter it inside and sometimes outside the museum. We'll also be trying to answer questions like, why are these people dancing in a museum? Why am I allowed to touch this? Is this really art? So far in the series, we've looked at artists who've made art using movement and bodies. But did you know that objects can also be part of performance art? We're used to thinking of art as something static that we look at. But sometimes artists actually do want you to touch what they make. Here's South Korean artist Hei Gu Yang speaking about a performance she staged here at Tate in 2012. I started to conceive this work called a dress vehicle. They are invited to manipulate the light. It's a kind of anonymous interaction maybe between the performer and the audience. Once again, if we time travel back to the 1960s, we find artists thinking about how art could begin to involve us, the audience. Kinetic and op artists like Victor Vassarelli and Jesus Rafael Soto considered the viewer to be an active participant in their work, which could only be truly completed once someone was moving around in front of their creations. Here's a work by Mary Martin. It's made up of mirrors positioned at different angles, so it appears different every time you walk around it and depending on where in the room it's positioned. How the viewer interacts with an artwork is something that lots of artists think about today. Here's the Spanish artist Cristina Iglesias, who invites the viewer to walk through her sculptures. The thing is that I, I do work on, on perception, on constructing different ways to perceive. From the very beginning, I'm always thinking in, in the viewer how you will encounter it. Other artists, like Rashida Wren, encourage the audience to get even more involved with their works. I want you to dismantle it and make your own work out of it. Let it to be transformed into many other They They explode like a big bang. Over the years, lots of artists have thought about different ways to create objects that need a kind of activation. In the 1970s, Nicola L. created a red coat designed to be worn collectively by a group of people. And here's Argentinian artist Amalia Pica, who asked the public to hold up a piece of paper bunting. This work in which two people who have never met before hold a string of bunting for hours at a time. What they have to do is not allow it to touch the floor. So there's a certain distance 
in which they need to stand from one another, which is a distance that it's too far from for them to establish a conversation. But at the same time, they're totally connected by this thing they're both doing. This kind of interaction can allow an artist to directly engage their audience in an active way, opening up the possibilities of art. One final example is Felix Gonzalez Torres, whose work invites the audience to take something away from the gallery, in this case, a piece of paper. Through his interactive works, he creates a literal passing on of responsibility for the artwork, from the artist to the audience. In the next episode, we're going to be asking... Okay. I'm going to stop sharing that and go back to my presentation. So as you saw, there are different kinds of artworks that require you as the viewer to participate in the work. So for the work to be complete. So the work is not complete unless you touch it. The work is not complete unless you take away from it. So um, Felix Gonzalez Torres, um, it was mentioned in this video where there are pieces of paper that you can take with you um, and that's the, that's the artwork. So another um, art by him um, that I like to cover today and talk about is this work. What is better than going to a museum and take candies, right? Get free candies. What is better than that? So there are so many candies in different colors and you as the viewer, you as the visitor can take candies and that's the artwork. I'm not going to talk about what the art is specifically about today, but we want to focus on the fact that we, if we are not to take away from those candies, it would have a completely different meaning. And I'll tell you why. Because the weight of these candies equal the weight of Felix Gonzalez Torres's partner. So every candy that you take with you um, means that the weight of these candies lessen, right? So it gives it a different meaning. But if you were not to interact with this piece, and if you were not to take away from those, it would have a completely different meaning, right? Um, and what is, again, I have a four-year-old son and he loves candies. And I'm sure he would love, love this piece. So I want us to do an exercise. Um, I know many of you have headphones that is connected to your um, computers, but try to stay close to your computer as you do this. And <laughs> if you find any parts being very challenging, you can skip that part. Um, but I want us to, to better understand how artists think through this form of art. I want us to do this exercise. Let's stand up and do a little bit of stretches. And I'm doing everything with you guys, okay? Um, the idea is that we have to, let's just stretch. Oh, okay, to the side. So the idea is that with most of the interactive art, we have to engage the art with our bodies, right? And a huge part of interactive art is called performance art, which we are in a way covering it today. So 
when we talk about performance art, it's important that we have flexible body. Not always, not, not every art requires that, but for the sake of this exercise and our conversation, we do these stretches, right? Okay, that was good. I hope that all of you could do this. Now I want you to look at the object that you were sitting on. The object that I was sitting on is this chair. You might be, you might be sitting on um, a bed or a stool, or it could be a bench. It could be a rock. It could be anything really. So I want you to look at the object and observe it carefully. Walk around it. If there is any pattern, just look at it carefully, right? We want to explore it. I know in my chair, one button is missing. Now I want you to, after you carefully look at it, I want you to name it. You can name it anything really. Um, I think I'm gonna stick to chair. Yeah, I'm going to name my chair. But you can name it anything. You can name it a thing. You can name it Sima. <laughs> you can name it Anna. You can name it anything. I'm going to name it chair. I want you to think about your body in relation to the object. Is the object flat? Mine is not. There are flat surfaces, but it's not completely flat like a rock. Um, so think about how your body engages with the surface, the different surfaces, right? Because mine has different surfaces. So I sit on it, right? That's how my body interacts with it. But it doesn't have to be this way. I can sit this way, right? I can put my feet up. Right? How do you interact with the object that you were sitting on? I'll give you a few seconds. I want you to think about different ways that you can sit on the object you were sitting on. And see and think about how your body moves around the object. And how every time your body shapes differently. You might be sitting on a carpet. So the possibilities are endless. So you can move around in different ways, right? The next 
next part, you already know the look of your object to some degree, but you'll be surprised. I want you to close your eyes and feel the object. I'm going to close my eyes and feel the object. I encourage you to do the same. Okay, let's do it. The texture is soft here. How's the texture of the, your object? Is it rough? Is it soft? The texture of the handles are very different because they are different material. How about the back? Keep your eyes closed, no cheating. <laughs> the back of my chair feels rough. Oh, I feel something here. It's very rough. I want you to feel your object. See it with your hands. Oh, folds here. Haven't noticed them. Okay, what's the next step? Open your eyes. And think about different body movements that you can incorporate your object. So how else can I use this chair that is not used on a regular basis. How else can I use this object? I can use it as a table. Right? I might be able to use it if I flip it over, I might be, might be able to use that as a hanger. Let me get my coat. Or my baby's blanket. Oh, that works. So I want you to think about how else you can use your object. Try a few I'll give you time. Hmm. Not bad, huh? I'm turning it into a shoe rack. Yeah. Would it fit? Yes. So these are only when we add other objects. But what if I use my body and try to interact with it differently than I usually do? Maybe I sit on it this way. Maybe I don't want to sit on it and I want to push it. I usually don't push it this way. Maybe I want to lift them. We usually don't lift chairs this way, do we? I 
I want you to do these exercises with me, okay? I'll give you a few seconds to think of one more exercise, okay? How else would you interact with the piece that you usually interact with? If it is a rock, how else would you use it other than sit on it or put objects on it? Maybe you fold it. Mm -hmm. Now I want you to think about what other body movements, what body movements can resemble your object? Now we can put away our object and think about mimicking your object. I'm sitting down, right? I'm mimicking my chair. Let's think about how you mimic your object. If it is an office chair, how would you mimic that? using your own body. Just wondering if it is a carpet, how would you mimic it? Let's do it. Okay, good job, bravo. You did the exercise. Now I want to talk about how I, as the artist in my works, think about interactive art. A good example that is very related to our conversation today is my work called Make a Wish. In this work, I made a huge pot of soup and I shared it with people. People made wishes as they were stirring the pot. And at the end, they served it themselves. The audience, the visitors served it. And then they ate it right there. So I asked the audience if they can help me out. So I gave them bowls and I asked different members in the audience, can you please help me distribute these? And many people were really happy to help. And I asked one person to um, serve the soup um, and um, they just had the soup right there. So again, going back to our conversation, if I just had a pot of soup, same soup there, without the viewers interacting with it, it would be a different piece of work, right? It would be a different um, artwork. But what made it complete was the interaction between the human bodies and the interaction between the people and the soup, right? The pot. And the soup turned out really good, I have to say. And one thing I had for the viewers to take home, and it was the recipe. So I printed the recipe on um, paper towels. They had the liberty to use the paper towel as a paper towel, or they could take it home. And I've had people who told me they still have it and they hung it in their um, kitchen. Um, so it is a recipe, it functions as a recipe, right? It is a legit recipe <laughs> that you can actually follow and make the soup. But it also is a paper towel. But it also 
as a work of art. Um, the other work that I did was called Bazaar. Bazaar was a work that uh, I actually did in 2015 in collaboration with many artists, at least five female artists. And there was this area that I set up um, and I had women selling uh, clothes, women selling um, clothes that were made by women. And I've had women selling um, jewelry that were made by women. Um, I've had um, women who were doing henna. Uh, if you don't know what henna is, it's sort of a tattoo they do on hand um, or anywhere else. Um, using henna, it's, um, it, it basically is a dye that colors your skin. And I was doing eyebrow threading and we were actually charging people. So we were thinking about how women own businesses, small businesses would able to uh, make money. So this is another image of the same piece. As you see, people are talking, people are getting services. Um, but this piece would have been sort of a sculpture without the human interactions. So if we were to just set up this tent and if we were to just have henna there and have people not touch it, it would be a sculpture. But the work became different and complete when people started paying us for every service they got. As you see here, the space is empty. So it is very different. It feels different to us, right? Versus here. versus here. So when the human body is missing from our pictures, then we can say these are ready-made art. That means they are already made somewhere else and we take them, put them in a gallery space. But what makes it different is that kids were actually able to play here. They were able to draw and um, play with each other. And that's why it's called interactive art. Or this work, it was a giant fabric work that was just in a giant building. So by looking at it, it's just a sculpture, right? But now it feels different because we see people interacting through the fabric. They are talking through this fabric. They walked into it. So with their bodies, they felt, they felt the smell, they felt the light they felt the fabric and they were actually invited to do that. So next time when you go to a gallery, think about, am I allowed to touch this work? And if so, how? Um, So this is a work that I thought would be funny to put here. Please touch the artwork. So it's very different from what we know, right? Um, 
I think I breathed through this. <laughs> uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hopefully get questions if you guys have. I left so much time for questions, didn't I? But then we can talk more. Do you guys have any questions? So I'll take this time to show you these works that I did. So they're not interactive. How do I know they're not interactive? Because they Thank are you, Sohela. Um, we do have some questions for okay. you in the chat. Tenzin is interested in understanding what... Oh, can... Yes, Sohela? Yes. So what led you to being so interested in interactive art? Has this always been in your focus in your practice? Um, so it has been, not always. Um, I think since I started um, doing art, um, Sahila, I'm so sorry. I, I think you you just got muted for some reason. Oh, I see. Oh, better. Thanks. Okay. There. Yes. So I'm going to I'm going to um, repeat the question. Sorry. What led you to being so interested in interactive art? Has this always been your focus in your practice? I personally, as a maker, and as an educator. The reason that I love educating is the interactive part, right? And I want to bring that into my art. Um, so it's very interesting for me when people think about my work and interact with it. And I, I see that interaction as a way to, as a way to think through my piece. So meaning, I actually know to some degree what they think of my work by the way they interact with the piece. So that's very pleasing for me. And I think I personally am such a touchy feely person. So it, everything has a different meaning for me when I can actually touch things. Even, even I can tell you this, I love touching all the paintings I see <laughs> in museums. <laughs> But it's me, right? So, so that could be why I'm very interested in, you know, um, getting my audience involved uh, in my work. And no, it has not always been the case in my practice. I've done, um, you know, um, um, works that were um, just video works or animation works and, um, but there was a point in my practice that I felt that something is missing, especially when I was talking about my own experiences and I felt like something is missing and people are not getting my message. And I thought, I was like, maybe I should get them involved with their bodies in the work. Um, so that was the start, um, but I've done paintings that were not interactive, etc. And John asked, um, how much do you like to hear back from people when experiencing your art? Or would you rather leave it, leave it to the mystery of their own interpretation? Um, well, I always like to hear feedback from people if that's what you're asking. Uh, but um, I don't necessarily think that it is uh, 
I, I, I like it when people um, understand different things from one piece um, so they can interpret it they, however they want. Um, but still, I oftentimes incorporate, you know, um, a statement that would make it easier for those who want to actually know what the piece is about. Um, and Lisa asks, uh, what inspires you to do participatory art, interactive art, uh, which I think I, I some degree answered. Um, the, I'm, I'm, I'm a very social person. And I think one reason that I like to see people interact with each other and with artworks is that. Um, and how do you get people to interact? Um, do you find that you have to start the active process for people to engage? Well, in every piece is different. Um, and that has been my biggest challenge, honestly, because I don't want to put a sign up that says, please interact, right? <laughs> but I want to force my audience in a way that is respectful <laughs> um, to interact with the piece. Um, so th there have been times that I was puzzled and didn't know how to invite people. So I was there and I had to interact with the piece so other people know they are welcome to do so. Um, but, but most of the times it's in the making of the piece, which hopefully I will be covering next in my next talk um, and think about you know, how artists actually um, collaborate with each other and how they think about um, that interaction. But it is, it is in the making of it for sure. I think uh, it, would be, it would be interesting for you to continue what you were starting there, pointing out the work that is not interactive, kind of as a contrast. So I, I think that it might be useful if you continued that sure, discussion sure, sure. you were about to start. Thanks. Absolutely. Yeah, so I have these works. So when we are talking about interactive, the interactive um, arts that I'm specifically covering today is when the work is done and you interact with it. But when we talk about interactive art, uh, you can actually think about it also in the making of the art. So people actually interact with uh, the art piece as they make it. And this is the work that I have here. Um, these are not really interactive, but the interactive part in these pieces, so they're not up for the viewer or the audience to touch, right? That's why they are put on the wall. And once something is elevated, up on the wall, we know we're not supposed to touch them, right? But if it was, for example, on the floor and or eye level, or it was spinning, or for however you were, your body was forced to touch it, you would know it's interactive. But, but for me, there is an interactive aspect to this piece because the, these are hair. As you see, they are human hair. And each hair was collected from different women in Iran. And that part is the interactive part in the making is, is what I mean, right? Um, so I collected, um, they participated in this piece by um, donating their hair. So the participation has a different meaning in works like this versus works that I showed you. Um, yeah. Thank you, Sohila. Um, I actually wanted to ask you a question that Mo had in the beginning when we were doing our, our tech-in um, that I thought it would be nice for other people to hear about too. Um, you talked about being influenced by um, Persian miniatures. 
And Mo, in doing some of his research, was he's, he was just like, what is a miniature? And I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, how you were influenced um, as a kid uh, from those Persian miniatures. I think Mo would love to hear that. Sure. So Persian miniature drawings are actually tiny drawings. And I can show you, I have, I have this on my wall, which actually is a cover of an album, but I separated the cover, which is wood. And they painted on the wood. And the image you see, it's very tiny. Do you see it compared to my hand? So it's very tiny. And this is called miniature drawing. And this is actually the image of my city. It's the, these are mosques, right? And the very traditional form of Persian miniature drawings are these. If you see, there are horses and people riding horses. So oftentimes they're very small, very delicate. And, um, um, and um, they oftentimes tell a story. Um, so for example, the story they cover here is um, they're riding and they're hunting, but oftentimes they are, there are series of them. And I actually have a book. I hope I can find it. Um, that has Persian furniture drawings too. So this is another one. So there's a specific technique that they use to do these drawings, which I don't know, unfortunately, but my plan is to go and learn them. But, um, but when it is in this scale, even, that is still is called miniature drawing. And I remember these, this is a poetry book. And this is what actually I was very inspired by. Because when I was nine, you know, when you're nine, really poetry in this level was just too much to handle. But the way I could connect with, um, with um, poetry and with um, that book was to flip through pages and look at these drawings. So each of them, as I mentioned, tell a story. And so many of them have um, myths, uh, Persian myths um, embedded in them. So I remember there were times that I was just copying them. And you know, going back to my practice and my feminist mind, I had so many issues with these uh, with the way they were presented, you know, the male and female bodies were very presented, very problematic. The female body always looked very delicate and thin and, um, and the men oftentimes were, um, you know, older. Um, this is another one. So these are Persian miniature drawings. And I know in India also, they have miniature drawings. Um, I'm not sure which traveled to which side, but they were influenced by each other, I'm sure. So poetry is a huge part of our culture. Um, so in every celebration, we always um, um, read um, different poetries and um, poems. And um, that's why books like this was, you know, there in our house, many of them for us to view. 
Um, so in every celebration for Eid, Mo mentioned for Eid, uh, which is the new year for us. Um, the Eid he mentioned was, might, be, might, might have been different, but um, in Eid, we always read uh, poetry, which again, those poetries oftentimes are uh, telling a story. I keep going back to telling stories, right? I know. <laughs> Speaking of stories, so Hela, thank you so much for sharing those, first of all. But I actually think we have someone here who has a question related to storytelling. Um, this is Safaya. Safaya, did you have a question for Sohela? Uh, yeah, um, I I grew up in an Islam, Islam, Islamic background, um, Palestinian, as well as a mixed heritage of um, African roots too. And so I've been doing a lot of research into like African or reality and then um, and uh, Aboriginal like storytelling, which is like an embodied learning. And so I've been, uh, I was like, your presentation was so interesting and fascinating, especially the way you were relaying information. And so I'm curious to like uh, your cultural or that rooted learning into, into how to tell a story. Um, and I'm curious, I guess I'm curious uh, to, uh, did I ask, ask that question? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it, so much of it is um, embedded in the culture, but also to what degree does a family practice that also is important. Um, first of all, you know, 1001 night stories, right? It, it comes from that land that I grew up in. Um, so telling stories is always important. Um, and I grew up in a house that, you know, in a time that really TV was, was not a thing. We had a very limited time for TV um, and it was just maybe 10 minutes a day. And um, not because my parents were um, not along it because it was not a thing, you know, um, thinking about, um, you know, war between Iran and Iraq and, you know, all the restrictions and uh, etc. So what we had access to was a radio and the radio oftentimes they had um, storytelling sessions, you know, and I remember we were just um, waiting and waiting for like 10 p.m. Uh, that was the time they, uh, there was this man um, who his, his sound still is in my mind and he was telling different stories, you know, um, from my father telling us stories of, you know, how he grew up in a rural area with, you know, um, um, with different challenges, you know, or my grandma telling us different stories about her um, challenges um, in her marriage, you know, and how she survived and how she got out of that, you know, marriage. And she was the only woman in that age I know who, who got a divorce in Iran, you know? <laughs> so, so I, we were sort of bombarded with different stories. And um, for me, without knowing, I was observing all of them and absorbing them all. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the question. And I think Amanda has a question. Oh, question from Morgan. Miniature drawings to convey stories, myths, uh, miniatures, uh, because there are so many stories and myths to share. Um, that was a question mark to fit as many stories as possible into space. Exactly, yeah, that's a, that's a good way to say it. Exactly, yeah, to just have one page to tell so many stories. Exactly, that, uh, thanks, thanks for um, pointing it out, yeah. And that's interesting because I can, I can tell one story from this image and you guys can tell a complete different story from the same image. Um, same goes with poetry, you know, I remember my dad would read one, um, one part and he would say, just interpret it however you want. Um, so same goes with um, miniature drawings, for sure. So Hela, thank you so much for such a 
just beautiful and insightful and experiential second presentation. Um, I really enjoyed it. Thank you for getting me to think about my, my seat actually has a carpet on it. And so I had to go back and forth when I was doing the exercise. Um, yeah, I just want to say thank you again so much. We're, we're about out of time for today. Um, but to the folks out there watching and listening, um, again, this was Sohela Azadi, and this was her second of three artist talks that she'll be giving as part of the 2021 KS Mocha Remote Artist and uh, Artist Lecture Series artist lecture series and residency. Um, so we'll look forward to hearing from her again in a month or two. Um, next week, we will welcome back the artist, master artist, Michael Bernard Stevenson Jr. to uh, share some work on his recent project, the Afro Contemporary Art Class. And he's actually invited me to kind of be part of that presentation. So I'll be wearing a different hat next week in addition to the intros and everything else. Um, and that'll be same time, same place, 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on the KS Mocha YouTube channel. Um, and we really appreciate everybody joining us, most especially our students from Dr. MLK Junior School. And of course, thank you so much to Mo. Your intros really actually make this wonderful and we all look forward to seeing you each week. Um, and so with that,